Hi everyone, my name is Yanni and I'm one of the executives on Superposition Toronto, a youth-led nonprofit dedicated to bridging the gender gap in STEM by creating educational opportunities and supportive communities. In July of 2020, we set out to change the narrative of women being left out of STEM and innovation. We've hosted many panels and hackathons in the past, which brings us to our space tech workshop today. So just to briefly introduce our speaker, Anika Rolock, even though many of you have already seen her bio, she's a PhD student in bioastronautics. She's been from NASA and is the chair of the AIAA, Women of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So I will pass it off to Anika, take it away. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen and get started. Awesome, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, today, I will be talking about space technology. Specifically, I'll be talking about uh, robotics in space. So hopefully this shares not the presenter view. Fantastic, can you all see that? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, so a little bit about me and why uh, <laughs> I can talk a little bit about uh, the, the topic of space robotics. Um, so my name is Annika Rolick. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at MIT a couple years ago now in aerospace engineering, uh, where I also studied creative writing and literature, uh, which has always been a passion of mine as well. And then I recently received my master's degree again a few years ago now um, from CU Boulder, where I'm currently working on my PhD in bioastronautics. Um, so bioastronautics is, is the study of how humans, um, how we keep humans alive and working in space. Um, and we actually work a lot with robots in space. Uh, because astronauts will use them a lot on the International Space Station. Um, I have experience working at NASA as well as some commercial companies like Blue Origin and Boeing, so if you have any questions about that, you can also email me about that afterwards as well. Um, and in my free time, I like to read, write. Uh, out here in Boulder, we have a lot of mountains, and so I like to road bike and trail run as well. Um, so that's a lot of my free time goes to. So I just want to start off by talking a little bit about what is a robot, which might seem like kind of a, maybe an overly simple place to start. Uh, but it turns out a robot's pretty hard to define. Uh, so my fun fact of the day is that the word robot actually comes from a Czech word. Um, a science fiction author named Carol uh, Kapik, I believe is how you pronounce it. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Um, but he coined, coined the name uh, robot in 1920 um, to, to describe something in a story. Um, and it comes from the Slavic word robota, which means uh, work or job. And my definition that I'm gonna to give to you is that a robot is a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically. The question of course that comes after that is, is a toaster a robot? Because you, know, you can program it and it does something that you like it to do, whether it puts the toast at you know, the four dial or the seven dial um, or it burns it. Um, but I wouldn't really call that complex. And so a toaster maybe isn't a robot. Um, a self-driving car, um, might not be thought of as a robot, but it does a lot of complex actions um, and you can program it. Um, so maybe your car is a robot in that case. Um, I've included some examples on the right here, including the Roomba, which is <laughs> a uh, vacuuming robot um, that a lot of people have in their houses now. And then to the right of that is a, it's called the cheetah. It's a animal-like robot from Boston Dynamics uh, that researchers use to practice programming robots to walk and to run and to jump and to do different complex physical activities. And then below, I also included a picture of a car plant because robots are actually very commonly used there to assemble cars because they do the same kind of action over and over again. Um, but I wanna kind of end this discussion on what is a robot by saying, you know it when you see it because a lot of people can point to a toaster and say, that's not really a robot, um, but they can point to the robotic arm from Iron Man and say, yeah, that's a robot. Um, so that's my kind of loose definition. So I wanna start my topic of space robotics uh, by talking about my favorite space robot, which is the remote manipulator system um, called RMS. Um, it's more commonly known as the Canada arm because Canada is the country that uh, designed and built the robotic arm. And it was first uh, created because the US went to Canada and said, we need a robotic arm. And Canada says, sure, we got you. We're really good at that. And so they provided the robotic arm for the space shuttle, uh, which was a reusable launch vehicle that would launch like a, a rocket and land like a plane. Um, and they were retired in 2011, but they flew for over 30 years. And so the Canadian government uh, 
together with this commercial company called MDA, worked to create this robotic arm, and they delivered five of them to NASA, and they would be installed on five of the space shuttles. And this robotic arm was fantastic for building and deploying things in space. Um, it was attached to the back of the space shuttle, and the majority of the space shuttle was actually cargo. And so they would launch satellites, they would launch telescopes, um, or have research labs in that big cargo bay space, um, which you can kind of see below here, uh, below that astronaut. And the robotic arm would be really great at reaching in and then pulling out some large object and then deploying it into space. Um, as you can see here, an astronaut's also riding on the, on the Canada arm here, uh, which is very important. <laughs> it looks kind of silly. Um, but one weird thing about space is that you don't have um, gravity or friction in air the same way you have on Earth. And so it's actually really hard to do maintenance because when you have a wrench in space and the astronaut's holding a wrench and goes to try to fix something, if they are floating, floating around like astronauts do, and they don't have anything to push against, they actually can just turn themselves in a circle instead of actually turning the bolt. And so you need something to anchor yourself against. And in most cases, Canada Arm would be the anchor for astronauts while they were fixing different things in space. I also included some pictures, uh, some more pictures of Canada Arm in action, um, doing great things. Uh, here's an astronaut riding on the end of it. Um, and then on the left here, it's one of my favorite photos of all time, which is the uh, Hubble Space Telescope being deployed. Um, as you can see, it's quite large. It was basically the limiter, limiting size of what to fit in the space shuttle cargo bay. Um, and it was uh, deployed using Canada Arm. And so here uh, it's upright, but originally it was lying down inside the space shuttle and the arm would reach in, grab it, and then uh, basically put it upright and the, all of the astronauts uh, kind of crawled all over it, making sure it was ready to go um, before it was released into orbit to send back uh, wonderful, beautiful pictures of our universe. Um, so Canada Arm 1 was a fantastic success. And so uh, the US decided that it wanted to make a space station in the 90s. And the space station was originally called Space Station Freedom. Um, and that's, that's not a joke. That's actually what they wanted to call it. Um, and that idea was scrapped basically because the US figured they couldn't build it all on their own. And so that was replaced by the idea of the International Space Station. And the International Space Station is currently still in orbit. Um, and it is a joint effort between over 15 different countries um, and uh, different uh, components were delivered over time starting in 1998. And it was built using uh, Canada Arm 1 on the space shuttle until they were able to get one module up there and then deploy what was called Canada Arm 2. And Canada Arm 2 was the one that would live on the space station. Um, and it, they would pass new components back and forth from the space shuttle to the space station. And Canada Arm 2 and 1 together built the space station with the astronauts. Um, and they called that first passing of the module the Canadian handshake because Canada Arm 1 shook hands with Canada Arm 2 and passed over a module. Um, this uh, Chris Hadfield is a, a famous Canadian astronaut who also um, piloted Canada Arm. This is not a picture of Chris Hadfield, but it is a picture I wanted to include of the Canada Arm control system um, because it's quite complex. Um, I think uh, because it's it's called an arm, but in reality it has quite a few more joints um, than our arms have, um, and it is able to spin around in ways that our elbows and our shoulders quite can't reach, um, and so. Controlling it takes a few different control levers, um, kind of like a joystick that you would use uh, for a video game, um, but you have multiple degrees of freedom. And so you have multiple monitors with different cameras showing you where each joint is and where each part of the arm is so that you don't accidentally kind of smack into the space station or smack into the space shuttle. Um, but most of the astronauts would float on over to this control system and they would watch the monitors and use Canada Arm that way. Um, in the space shuttle, so for Canada Arm 1, they had a very similar setup to this, uh, but they actually had also um, a window that they could look out and view Canada Arm as it was moving around the outside of the shuttle. Looking forward to the future, um, hopefully if you are into space, you're, you're aware of the Artemis program, which is um, the program to return humans to the moon with a permanent presence. Um, and like the International Space Station, it is an international effort. Um, and so in 2020, the United States signed um, a bunch of bilateral agreements with different nations, and these were called the Artemis Accords. Um, and Canada, or Canada has agreed 
to do what they're really good at, which is make robotic arms. And so Canada Arm 3 is planned um, for what's called the Lunar Gateway. And the Lunar Gateway will be a space station type vehicle that floats, um, floats around the moon and serves as a jumping off point for expeditions down to the moon, as well as potential expeditions um, to places like Mars and deep space once we um, kind of work up the knowledge and our ability to live away from Earth for a long time um, well enough to, to head to places like Mars. So that was a little bit about Canada Arm, which is one of the more complex single pieces of robotic equipment that's currently in space. Um, but next I wanna talk about one of my favorite robots, which uh, collectively are the Mars Rovers, uh, which are, um, there's a few of them now. And I wanted to include this photo because I don't think people realize just the size differences of the different rovers. Um, so in the bottom left here, we have the rover Sojourner from the Pathfinder mission, uh, which landed in the 90s. Actually, it was landed the year I was born, so 1996. Um, and it looks kind of like, you know, about a dog-sized rover. Um, I'll talk in, in greater detail about each of these missions in future slides, but I want to just point out the different rovers here. Uh, we also have Spirit, the Spirit and Opportunity size rovers, which are these ones, which are kind of like an ATV sized vehicle. Um, but this big one here is the size of Curiosity and Perseverance, which are two rovers that landed in um, 2012 and then actually this past year, Perseverance landed. Um, and that's about the size of a Mini Cooper car, <laughs> which I don't think people realize just how big the rovers have gotten um, with their ability to explore and do different science. Um, it's quite impressive and I'm kind of always, it surprised me when I first learned how big those Mars rovers are. So I mentioned Pathfinder mission, which was the first uh, robotic rover mission to the Red Planet. Um, it la launched in December 1996 um, and then landed about six months later. Um, it was really just a technology demonstration, which is how NASA does a lot of their work. Um, it's, it's risky to send things to space and it's even riskier to try to land them on somewhere like Mars. And so technology demonstration is our way of saying, hey, look, we can make this very simple, small mission and we can show that it works. And that paves the way for future missions because we can point to that and say, hey, it worked then. Uh, we can do similar things and it'll work again. And so Pathfinder was designed for a mission of seven souls. Uh, soul is the Martian day. So the earth rotates in about 24 hours and that's our earth day. Mars takes about 25 hours to rotate. It's a little bit longer, I believe. Um, I might need to check that. It's either one hour longer or one hour shorter, but either way, everyone who works on Mars rovers is on Martian time, so they're on Sol time. And that means that their schedule slowly rotates until they're working um, kind of weird hours, especially during critical times of the mission. Um, and so they'll be working overnight, they'll be working um, well into the early hours of the morning because it'll be daytime on Mars and they have to get stuff done. So, uh, the main mission of Pathfinder, like I said, was to really show that this, this uh, technology could work. Um, and even though it was only designed for about a week, it lasted for 83 days, which is really impressive um, until basically a bunch of dust covered the solar panel um, and it couldn't get enough power to keep going. Um, but it massively overdelivered, and it did a lot of work um, testing those robotic capabilities, like those, those wheels that you see, as well as analyzing um, the atmosphere, the weather patterns, uh, in the rocks and soil to see what type of rocks they're made of, whether or not there's liquid water, um, and kind of what the average temperatures are, what the average wind speeds are, and really doing all the planetary science of learning about the red planet. The next rovers we sent up, now that we had successfully shown um, that Pathfinder and that a rover could land and work for a pretty long time on the red planet, um, were Spirit and Opportunity. These were called the Mars Exploration Rovers. They were twin rovers, uh, both of which that look like this. Um, they look kind of like, I guess kind of like Wally -E, actually. <laughs> um, but they were a little bit bigger than Pathfinder, but they still had these six wheels. And those, the wheel uh, arrangement is actually pretty important um, because as good as four wheels are for driving around Earth and on pavement, um, the six points of contact is really important when you have uneven rocky surfaces. Um, so each of those joints can move individually. Um, so when um, one of the rovers is driving over larger rocks, you always have all of the wheels on the ground. You don't want to get into a position where the rover could flip over um, or have um, a loss of traction because one wheel is up in the air. And so the mission of the Mars Exploration Rovers uh, was to kind of continue that, that initial 
um, poking around that Pathfinder had done. And so it was tasked with searching for and characterizing all the rocks, um, as well as really trying to look for signs of water. So were there lake beds? Were there signs that water had run down um, in a stream or in rivulets somewhere? Um, and even though these rovers were designed for a mission of 90 days, uh, Spirit lasted for six years, and then Opportunity lasted until 2018. Um, so once again, these rovers just massively over-delivered um, and outlasted their uh, design lifetime by, by many years. And so they're kind of applauded through um, the science community for doing all that great work over time. And so before this past year, the most recent rover that we had uh, launched and landed on the Red Planet was Curiosity. Um, and I mentioned earlier that Curiosity was quite a bit larger um, than the other two rovers. And so instead of doing two smaller rovers, we did one very large one full of different science equipment. Um, and Curiosity was launched in 2012. And uh, it had a, a, a longer list of science tasks that it wanted to accomplish. Um, so just for some background, um, there is something called the Decadal Survey. And that is a survey uh, that NASA puts out and they literally put out a call to every scientist in the world and they say, what are your priorities for the next 10 years? What questions about the earth, about the universe, about different planets um, do you want answered in the next 10 years? And NASA uses that to guide what missions they fund and which they develop um, to make sure that we're actually doing useful things in space that scientists are curious about. And so in the 2010s, the four science goals that NASA had laid out from the Decadal Survey into this long-term Mars plan that they had was to determine whether life ever arose on Mars, characterize the climate of Mars, characterize the geology, and then prepare for human exploration of Mars. And so in many ways, this was building on what the other rovers did, while also trying to figure out things like, what is the radiation like on the surface? What is the temperature like? Um, what can humans um, use on the Martian surface to survive? Can they um, for example, if there is water ice, can they use the water for different things? Um, can they make jet fuel at, or sorry, rocket fuel out of the water, which you can do by separating it out into oxygen and hydrogen? Um, and just different ways that you can potentially survive on a different planet. So in the same way that Spirit and Opportunity were twin rovers, uh, Curiosity also had a twin, and that was called Perseverance. They weren't launched at the same time, but after the success of Curiosity, um, this twin rover, they look very similar, they're the same design, the same material, um, was built and launched. And so Perseverance was launched, um, I guess, two summers ago now, so in July 2020, and it landed this past February, which was uh, very exciting. Um, and its mission, again, was kind of a continuation of Curiosity. So it's looking for habitability, so anything that could show that life could exist, um, even in super... Um, remote areas of Mars, things like extremophiles are creatures that live in like the sulfur vents under the ocean of the Earth. Um, and so looking for things like that, could that could live in very extreme environments. Um, and to do that, it looks for things called biosignatures, which are whatever animals and plants and fungi and different uh, living creatures create as byproducts. So a biosignature for a plant would be something like either a fossil or um, the oxygen it lets out when it creates, it takes in CO2 and makes oxygen. So it's testing for all of that as it drives around Mars. Uh, it's also doing something very important, which is caching samples. So Perseverance is the start of something called Mars Sample Return. And that is a long relay race uh, that NASA is doing together with the European Space Agency uh, to re return samples from Mars. And so as it drives around, um, it is taking it's drilling down and taking core rock and regolith um, and then putting them into little containers and leaving them um, along with um, a little indicator that, that kind of lets people know where it is um, for future missions and one that will come, come down in the mid 2020s uh, to land, collect it, and then launch it back towards the Earth. Um, it also is doing something called in situ resource utilization, which uh, means can we make resources using the different materials of Mars that would be useful for humans to live. And so one thing that um, was being tested on Perseverance is called MOXIE. Um, it's an acronym, I'm not gonna uh, claim to know what it stands for, um, but it, it is an oxygen generation test. And so can we make oxygen from the CO2 in the Martian atmosphere? Um, because if we can, that's super promising uh, for future human exploration because we don't have to bring all that oxygen with us. 
we can just start making it once we get there uh, to supplement the oxygen we already have. And another important thing that the perseverance brought with it is something called ingenuity. Uh, and I showed up, I, I included a picture here on the top right of the rendering of ingenuity. And it is actually a Martian helicopter. Um, it looks very bare bones and that's because uh, launching heavy things into space is really expensive. And this is a technology demonstration. So they wanted to include this helicopter to show that it's possible to fly things like helicopters on a different planet um, without giving it a dedicated mission that might be potentially a waste of money or kind of risky to do. And so Ingenuity was included on the back of Perseverance. Um, and the question was whether or not we could fly it on Mars. And its first flight was last April, uh, which I included in the GIF here. Um, and the answer is yes, we can fly helicopters on Mars. Um, the atmosphere of Mars is actually a little bit less dense than Earth. So people were kind of worried that um, it would be difficult to achieve enough lift in the thinner atmosphere. Um, but it's shown that it's incredibly useful to have things like small helicopters to aid in our rovers because they can hop up, look around, scout out different areas to go to, and then land again um, before Perseverance decides where it wants to drive off to. Um, so it's good for detecting different obstacles, foreseeing future sites that are interesting. Um, and it's also paving the way for a future mission that I'll talk about later um, called Dragonfly, which I'm really excited about. So I mentioned that per uh, Perseverance and Curiosity were twin rovers, that they were basically identical with some updated science equipment. Um, but I misspoke a little bit because their wheels are actually one of the bigger differences. And while both rovers have the same six, uh, six wheels, with the independent uh, gimbaled arms. Um, the wheel uh, treads are actually quite a bit different. And that's because while they were testing, uh, while they were driving Curiosity around, um, they realized that the wheels were getting really beat up. Like there were holes in the aluminum, the sheet metal that were starting to form way faster um, than they, they wanted them to. And so they updated the wheels for Perseverance to try to make sure that the same thing wouldn't happen um, on that rough Martian surface. Uh, rovers are also uh, really, really not fast. <laughs> um, they really only go about 100, 200 meters per hour um, at maximum speed, and they don't spend most of their time driving. They actually spend most of their time sitting and doing science. Um, but they're that slow because A, it's energy efficient, um, and the path planning can take several days, if not weeks. And again, I mentioned earlier that one of the worst things that could happen is the rover flipping over or getting stuck somewhere. And so um, they want to make sure that they won't do that and so that they'll take some of the slower, more methodical routes um, and not just kind of dune buggy around the surface because they don't want to accidentally flip the rover over. And so I mentioned energy um, and rovers have been powered by different things. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because there's a lot that goes into uh, making these rovers and making sure that they operate and stay um, alive, you know, in most cases exceeding their design life. Um, so the earlier rovers, like Sojourner, Spirit, and Opportunity, the smaller ones, use solar panels, uh, which works fairly well at Mars, even though it's a little bit farther from the sun. Um, but you run the risk of dust storms being a problem. And I mentioned that uh, in the Pathfinder mission, Sojourner, the rover, um, was killed off basically because it couldn't get enough sunlight. Um, and that was also the problem at the end of Opportunity's life in 2018. And so um, solar panels are great because it's just a passive way to get energy um, they're great on Earth, too, because we're closer to the sun. Um, but on Mars, you have the risk of not being able to uh, get the power when you need it. And they also don't provide um, a high, a high just power output in total. So on more recent rovers like Curiosity and Perseverance, um, we've used something called a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which we all call RTGs for short, because that's a big mouthful. And it is a small... Uh, nuclear power generator, and it uses plutonium-238, which is just a specific enriched type of plutonium, uh, and then they passively generate a bunch of heat, which then allows you to create electricity from that heat generation. Um, it can output about 2,000 watts um, of thermal power, so in this picture up here you see, uh, I think it's Curiosity's RTG, um, it's actually venting some of that heat out because um, you don't want all that heat to be uh, floating around inside the rover. It's not great for the electronics. Um, so some of that heat's going to electricity, but some of it's also just being vented out. And it'll make about 120 watts of electrical power, which is enough to run a lot of the science equipment on board the bigger rovers. 
Um, so how do we get these rovers down to the ground? <laughs> it's a, it, it takes a village, honestly. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics in um, robotic exploration is how we figure out how to land these things on the Martian surface. Um, so I included a few pictures here of the different ways that we slow these things down before they, they touch down on Mars. Um, the parachute is always used uh, because this is a, a supersonic parachute. It's called a disc gap band parachute because there's uh, the gap here <laughs> in the disc and uh, it's a way of keeping it stable at very, very high speeds. Um, this photo was taken in the NASA Ames Wind Tunnel, which is a NASA center um, up near San Francisco. Uh, and this is, I believe it's the biggest wind tunnel in the United States, if not the world, and they often put planes in them. Um, and you can see the people standing here next to the parachute because the parachute is absolutely massive. Uh, we need very large parachutes because like I said earlier, the Martian atmosphere is quite thin. Um, and so we need more surface area to slow down the rover before it touches down. Um, on the left side here, I've included two of my favorite ideas that have been used to do the final slowing down and landing of the rovers. Um, on the top here, you have an engineer standing next to the airbags that were used for uh, Sojourner and then Spirit and Opportunity, um, which I, I kid you not, someone just in a room suggested, why don't we use airbags? And the engineers all kind of looked at each other and said, why not? And they went up to the San Gabriel Mountains outside of the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab where these rovers were being built. And they built these big airbags and they just dropped them out of helicopters onto the mountains and they would roll down the mountains. Um, and if the stuff inside was still intact at the bottom, they said, yep, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. And that's what they used. And likewise, uh, for the, the more recent rovers that are larger, the airbags wouldn't quite make the cut because um, Curiosity and Perseverance are quite a bit heavier. They had to use what's called Sky Crane. And Sky Crane is shown here. It's kind of like a jet pack that is on top of the rover. And so when the parachute's done all it can, um, they cut the cords of the parachute and then Sky Crane begins to fire kind of like Iron Man and then lower the rover down while it's hovering, um, like a nice little drone delivery. And then once it has touched down, uh, Sky Crane kind of just takes off and then crashes itself somewhere else because it's no longer useful and the rover is free to carry on with exploring. Um, so because I think this is kind of just a, a hilarious and also um, one of the cooler parts of exploration, I've included a few videos of our, our landing techniques. Um, so hopefully these work over Zoom. So this is the airbag method.
so that was a little bit of the uh, airbag landing. Um, I don't think there was sound being shared over Zoom, but there wasn't really much sound except for just some dramatic music playing because NASA likes to make these dramatic videos. Um, and so these ideas came out of, uh, just before we watch the next video, I'm gonna explain a little bit about um, the way ideas like this come about. Um, there is literally a room at NASA JPL that is called Left Field. Um, and they jokingly call it that because there are no bad ideas that can come out of that room. Um, and that is the room where people proposed both the airbags and the sky crane maneuver um, as ways to get the rovers down to the surface. Um, and in that room, you propose the idea and someone says, okay, let's let's you know run some numbers, let's be engineers and pretend like this actually can work and believe that it could work for a second. And in the case of both those ideas, they did work and they ended up being used on the rover missions. Um, so I just think that's kind of a cool, um, no dumb questions, no dumb ideas kind of way that uh, NASA does a lot of its exploration. Um, and so I think I have a little bit of time for this video to, um, let me see if I can get the sound being shared for this. Maybe not, okay. Uh, so before I move on, I just want to talk a little bit about that that landing. Um, that the second video I showed was um, from the Perseverance landing last February, and that was the first time we'd actually put really good cameras on the rover while it was uh, while it was landing. 
Um, and so the footage that came back was just absolutely incredible for all the engineers who had worked on it because we could finally see what it was like uh, to land. Um, because that first video I showed was actually just a rendering and an artist's rendition of what was happening uh, for an illustration. Um, and so getting that footage was really good for A, seeing how the parachute actually deploys to make sure that it's uh, deploying correctly. Um, there's not like taking a long time or anything like that, um, as well as seeing, making sure just, you know, uh, everything is working all right on board when it's being lowered down. Um, I don't know if, it, if you noticed, but while it was actually still descending, it swerved to the left. And that's because it was using what was called terrain relative navigation. And so Perseverance had this cool new technology demonstration where they put a camera on the bottom and the camera is using what's called machine vision, uh, which is a something related to machine learning um, where the rover can look down and see different uh, craters and say, that's a crater, that's a crater, that's a rock. I don't want to land in those. Um, and so it was trained over different features in places like Utah and through pictures of Mars. Um, to say, okay, I know what's flat and what's not flat, and I want to try to land on the on the flat parts. And so it had one redirect maneuver that it was able to do, uh, just fuel-wise, it had enough fuel to do one maneuver. And so it waited until it was ready and decided to swerve a little bit to get to a flatter area to land, uh, which was just like super awesome and, and fascinating. Um, and it's tricky to watch these landings uh, because they actually aren't happening in what we call real time. Um, because Mars is so far away, there's a delay in the communication between uh, Earth and Mars. And so um, the, the landings are actually timed to be um, as, I guess, as short as a delay as possible, uh, which ends up being about, about six minutes round trip, um, six to seven minutes. And so they call that um, seven minutes of terror because for all the engineers on the ground, um, there are seven minutes between when the rover actually touches down and when we get the data back saying it has touched down. Um, and there's nothing you can do in the meantime because it's already happened. We're just waiting to get that signal back. Um, and so communication is actually a huge part of operating these rovers. Um, I mentioned that they are on different schedules than us and that's because we need to wait for daytime to do a lot of our work, um, to see what's going on, um, to drive things around. In the case of solar powered rovers, we had to literally wait for the sun to get us give the rovers power. Um, and in terms of actually talking to them, uh, we use something called the Deep Space Network. Um, and so on the right, that's actually a picture of me out in Goldstone, California, um, near, I think that's the 60 meter antenna. Um, so these antennas are absolutely massive. Um, and they're what we use uh, to do all of our, our uh, communication with um, different spacecraft um, and with the rovers in particular. Um, and because the Earth is turning and Mars is um, generally on one side of us and we're slowly going around the sun together, uh, we actually need more than one location with these antennas. So we have one in Goldstone in California, um, and then we have one in Madrid, Spain, and one in Canberra, Australia. Uh, and these are basically a third of the way around the world each. And that means that we always have acquisition with two of those antennas at a time to make sure that the rover has um, at least two, two of these antennas are getting the signal at once. Um, Oh, I misspoke earlier. That's the 70 meter antenna uh, because the antennas tend to be 34 or 70 meters. Um, so all, all the spacecraft that are out there right now, including, um, for example, the rover from the Chinese Space Agency, um, the asteroid mission that Japan just launched, we all share the same deep space network. Um, and so it's really um, a great example of international cooperation to make sure that we're sharing time on these really important phone calls that we need to make to our spacecraft. Um, on Mars, we also use relay orbiters, and that's because if the rover is landing and it's on the wrong side of the planet, um, that signal can't go through the planet to get to us if Earth is on one side, for example. Um, and so we'll have a satellite around Mars right now, it's called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it relays that signal back to us. So think of it as, um, let's see if I can like, map this out for you. And this is the planet, and the rover's landing here, I'm trying to talk to Earth over here. If we have a satellite up here, it'll zigzag that signal back to Earth uh, using that relay satellite. Um, actually getting that data takes minutes to hours, depending on if you're sending uh, information, a signal, a photo, for example, or um, a video will take even longer. Imagine trying to um, stream Netflix, but you're trying to do it from Mars. It's going to take hours uh, to load anything. And rover operations, like I said, are 
Um, really just like one of the more fascinating jobs <laughs> on the planet. Um, these are all pictures of the rover operators uh, working at home because a lot of people have been forced to work um, and live remotely, you know, kind of doing school, doing our jobs remotely or just changing the way we do them. Um, and so the, the rover operators, uh, often called, called drivers, operate um, on souls, like I mentioned before. Um, and oh, I had I have the uh, conversion. So a soul is 24 hours and 39 minutes. So it is slightly longer than an Earth day. Um, and these rover operators work together with a team of scientists to plan out their routes, to plan interesting things to look at. Um, because at the end of the day, the reason we go to different planets is to answer scientific questions. Um, and so they can't unfortunately just do like Grand Theft Auto and like drive around wherever they want. They have to actually work with this big team of people who all have a stake in what to explore on the red planet. Um, there are also what are called occultations. And that's actually when Earth and Mars are on different sides of the sun and the sun is in the way. And during those times of year, um, we just can't communicate to the rover. And so all the drivers get about a week off <laughs> while we wait for the planets to dance around the sun um, and get back into a spot where we can communicate. Um, and so that's just like an interesting, an interesting fact about uh, the way the planets are in orbits work. The Mars Yard is a really awesome uh, other aspect of Mars rovers that I wanted to talk about. Um, and that picture I first began this talk, the section of the talk with was from the Mars Yard. Um, and the Mars Yard is just like this big pile of dirt in <laughs> NASA JPL with these big sheds that contain uh, little tiny uh, mock-ups of the rovers. I say tiny, they're not tiny. They're the same size as the regular rovers. Uh, but they have different sized rocks and different sized um, kind of uh, like shale and different types of rocks that um, are built to mimic what we see on Mars. And so we have a spot where we're not sure if the rover can, you know, make it over this little ledge or really get around this rock. They just take these what are called scarecrow rovers um, that are basically the same as the rover without all the expensive scientific equipment. Um, they take those out and then they uh, practice and they say, okay, this should be able to do the exact same thing as the actual one. And they practice it again and again. And when they were discovering that the wheels of curiosity were getting just like chewed through because of the Martian rock, they actually just took the scarecrow rover and then they drove it around in a circle for hours to see how long the wheels would last, um, to see like how how long they had left and also just whether or not they, there was anything they could do to prevent that um, the holes forming in Curiosity's rover uh, wheels. Um, so yeah, and that's the Perseverance scarecrow on the right there with the different wheels. You can see them being a little flatter. Um, so I mentioned the operators and I mentioned the people at the Deep Space Network. Um, I didn't talk too much about the scientists um, and you saw in those videos that there's a bunch of people who get really excited whenever the rover does anything. Um, and those are people are all critical people who are involved with creating these rovers. Um, it really takes a village. Um, space exploration is not a thing that this lone genius can do on, on their own. Um, it takes hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, with people manufacturing different components um, and different scientists who are all analyzing the data that we get back. Um, and this is a photo of just the Mars Perseverance team. Um, that includes everyone who worked on the helicopter, everyone who worked on the wheels, everyone who is up in the Mars yard driving the rovers around, um, and as well as the scientists who designed the cameras, who designed the different lab equipment that tests the soil, um, and the people who, you know, worked on the joints. And so um, that's the whole team. <laughs> it takes a lot of people. Um, and I just think that it's worth highlighting that because um, I don't think uh, generally people don't realize how many people it takes to, to do these things. So I wanna just turn to the future a little bit here because there are some missions coming up that I find really exciting. Um, I mentioned that Ingenuity, the helicopter was a technology demonstration, a, a tech demo for helicopters. And that's because we have a mission planned called Dragonfly. Um, and that is going to one of Saturn's moons called Titan. Um, and Titan is a, a big moon because both Saturn and Jupiter have pretty big moons and it's bigger than Mercury. And it actually has liquid methane on the surface because it's cold enough out there that methane, which is a gas uh, most of the time here on Earth, uh, cools down and becomes a liquid. And so on Titan, methane is actually forms its own water cycle. So methane evaporates, it turns into a cloud, uh, it rains down, and then it forms lakes. And so that's fascinating. This is something out of like science fiction, but it's like right next door to us here in our solar system. And so uh, Dragonfly is a mission built to explore Titan, um, and it'll hop around on these little like uh, kind of sled-like runners it has 
um, and it'll pop over the lakes and be used to explore Titan. Um, so really looking forward to that. Uh, it's being uh, led out of the Applied Physics Laboratory in, uh, I believe it's in Baltimore, Maryland, um, along with teams from NASA to build the actual hardware. Another cool moon that I want to highlight that's being uh, explored pretty soon is Europa. So Europa is a Galilean moon of Jupiter, and that Galilean just means that Galileo, the astronomer, was one. Um, it's one of the moons that he he uh, discovered, and Europa is awesome because it's basically a giant ocean world. Um, whereas Titan has all these methane lakes, Europa just has this huge ocean underneath a shell of ice. Um, and that's fascinating. And we know that, at least here on Earth, we have a lot of things that live in the ocean that seem kind of alien and wild and different and that can live in these extreme environments. And so we want to explore the ocean. Um, so on the top right here, I've uh, included a picture that's a potential kind of future concept of a, a drill that would go down and drill through the ice and then explore underwater. Um, that's not happening yet, <laughs> but we are sending a mission called Europa Clipper. And that's this, uh, this orbiter here uh, on the top left. And Europa Clipper will uh, go into orbit around Europa and basically start learning all we can about how thick the ice is, um, what if the ice is actually water ice or if it's some other uh, element uh, or compound, um, as well as just like the different features of taking high resolution images of Europa. Um, and so it's launching in October 2024. Um, and it'll really pave the way for those future missions to exploring the, the icy moons like Europa. So that's all I had for today. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. I know that was kind of like just a giant uh, uh, like rush of different missions and different robots that we sent to explore the solar system. But I hope that that was a good, uh, an okay overview of some of the missions that make me really excited and kind of the different, um, not as talked about aspects of how we drive them and how many people it takes and how we land them on the surface. Um, but yeah, thank you all for, for listening and for having me and I will open the floor to any questions you have. Yeah, thank you, Annika, for the very insightful and interesting presentation with a lot of pictures. Um, I was also really fascinated by the size difference of the Mars rovers and actually how slow they go, <laughs> which now makes sense because you've explained it. But we've also gotten a few questions from the sign-up form, so I'll just start off by asking them, and then if any participants have questions, you can leave them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, so the question was, this was from Gabriel, I'm not sure if he's here today, but he asked, how will private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin affect the space industry in the long term? And I remember you mentioned earlier on that you intern at Blue Origin, so I'm excited to see what take you have on this. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so I want to start by quickly addressing how they've already impacted the space industry and before getting onto that long-term vision. So um, a lot of those companies really, we took it, like NASA took a chance on those companies through what was called the Commercial Space um, Partnership Program. And that started in the US under Obama and basically uh, allowed NASA to outsource a bunch of stuff to people, people like SpaceX. Um, and so that allowed us to stop trying to do it all in house um, and let kind of market competition uh, give us, you know, a cheaper option. And so SpaceX took advantage of that and let us, uh, it now gave the US the ability to launch astronauts on the Falcon rockets, um, as well as you can the Dragon capsules for cargo and for returning people to the space station. Um, so it's been really, really good for um, getting a bunch of fresh people and fresh, fresh ideas into the space, uh, space industry. Um, in terms of future, stuff. I think um, those commercial companies will continue to do really great work and to bring fresh ideas um, and to kind of move fast in ways that NASA can't because they're beholden to the taxpayer and have to be kind of responsible because they're a civil agency. Um, so commercial companies are really free to take risks. And that's really important when, um, you know, the U.S. government kind of holds NASA to a higher standard because the, the companies can get away with like, you know, blowing up rockets in the launch pad before, before people are in them. Um, but if NASA did that, um, the government would say that's way too risky, um, even before people are in them. Um, so that's kind of what I think they'll continue to do is, is be able to test out technology faster than NASA would be able to. Yeah, and just to add on, I know that like a lot of, well, wealthy, normal people are going to space now. So where do you sort of see this going? Because I'm maybe a few decades ago, people only those super wealthy people could ride airplanes. 
but now every almost all of the middle class can. So where do you see all of this going as well? Yeah, so the other side of the coin of all these commercial space companies coming up is commercial space tourism. Um, and I, you know, like I, I, I'm conflicted about it because to me, I've always loved like the science and some of the, you know, amazing work that's happening in space. And I think everyone should have access to that. I think it would be incredible to let the average person go to space. Um, I think it's still going to be a while. And I think um, it's still inaccessible for a lot of people when it's still, you know, auctioning off seats for millions of dollars. But I do think eventually it'll come down to, I wouldn't say aircraft, like airplane ticket price, but I will say it'll probably get down to like thousands or like $10,000, which is like a lot of money, but it's, that's more accessible than paying millions of dollars um, for a ticket. And so we'll definitely see more people fly. And I think the, the one good side of that is that there is something called the overview effect. And that's when you go to space and you see the earth and you see how fragile it is. And like, my hope is that, you know, with billionaires flying in space and people who have a lot of wealth and a lot of influence, if they see the earth like that, um, it is like an actual scientific thing that you experience this kind of like epiphany of like, oh, we got to protect the earth. And so I hope that they take that to heart and that if more people start flying, that more people will uh, buy into that and be able to use their influence towards that as well. Mm -hmm. And just to ask about how you really got into this industry, and there was someone who asked what type of schooling you need, and I also noticed that another person was like, I'm studying metrotronics right now, would this be feasible if I want to pursue something in astronomy? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so schooling. Um, definitely just keep taking math. Um, I don't actually like math that much. I know people, I think, have this misconception that people who go into science is like love math and I think math is a tool and you have to be good enough at using math to use that as a tool um, but it's totally fine if you like don't you're just like not super passionate about it um, I kind of found my way into engineering through physics like I really enjoyed physics I had a great teacher in high school um, and it made for me it made math make sense because uh, I was able to apply it to the world around me um, but I think you also can get into things like space and astronomy um, not through conventional engineering ways. We It takes everyone in space. And I think um, as long as you're passionate and able to learn a lot about the industry, um, there are people who like did art degrees and now work at NASA because we need people to make those renderings and to design things and to show engineers um, ways to prototype things like the way architecture students build things like um, as prototypes. And so there's like wild ways to get into this industry that aren't necessarily conventional. Um, it just takes a lot of hard work, I think, and those pathways are being more well known now. Um, hopefully that kind of answered the question, but yeah, I, I missed the second half of that question. Yeah, I believe someone was saying that they study metrotronics and I guess you already did answer sort of how you can really be from any background as long as you have the prerequisites, which you can study for, I believe. Yeah, you can study for them and you can always come back and learn them. Um, it's okay if you like do, you know, like I, I failed a bunch of math tests my freshman year of high school in grade nine. And like, I, you know, worked really hard the rest of high school and was able to come back from that. And you can always come back for it later in life too. So if you like go down one path and then say, hey, I'm gonna, you know, take a bunch of online classes in coding or, you know, go to a makerspace and start building stuff myself. You know, you can get into the kind of the engineering side from different ways. Um, in terms of, it's in mechatronics, I think that's just, like kind of like robotics i i'm not as familiar with some of that like that terminology um but if you want to get into the astronomy that way you definitely can i would say learn about kind of the ways we do astronomy and like how telescopes work because that's a lot of optics it's a lot of physics um but really it's a lot of like can you get the data back from these telescopes and interpret the universe that way um and so like things like data analytics are also like hugely important um, and they don't sound as fun, but they're really cool once you start applying them to cool things. So um, you'd be, be kind of surprised about like what really basic stuff can apply. And I guess we can get to the questions in the chat if you want to answer them. Yeah, for sure. I have a direct message question um, from, I believe, Yonda that I can read out, uh, which is, for the airbag landings, are the weights placed on the bottom of the rover to guarantee the rover landing on the right side, or how is it done? Uh, yes, yeah, exactly that. So they they put weights at the bottom of the rover's platform to make sure that it doesn't land upside down. Um, and that's just a way of making sure that it, it'll eventually settle to the right side and then it'll land right way up. So that's exactly correct. 
Uh, next question from Rebecca is, was there a specific mission or moment that motivated you to venture into space engineering? Uh, yeah, so two things. Um, the space shuttle to me was like the coolest thing ever growing up. I grew up when the space shuttle was still flying routinely. Um, and unfortunately, I never got to see it launch. Uh, but to me, like I, I loved planes and I loved space. And so having this like giant plane like thing that would launch and then bring people and then land again like a plane was the coolest thing. Um, space shuttle also, I guess like you probably all are a little bit young to remember, um, but it opened the door for scientists to go to space. A lot of the shuttle astronauts weren't from a military background like the previous astronauts had been. So suddenly we were flying people who were medical doctors, people who were chemists, people who were trying to just um, learn how different plants behaved in space. Um, and so we got this kind of like more interesting group of astronauts that wasn't necessarily as military based, uh, which was really cool to see in shuttle too. And we got to you know, fly you know, the first woman, the first African-American woman, um, just like a whole more diverse set of astronauts um, because of that military requirement being relaxed. And then, oh, sorry, the second part of that was that I loved the movie Apollo 13 as a kid and I watched it with my grandma all the time. And so that also got me into space. <laughs> um, Uriel says, uh, do you have any suggested books on space tech and astronomy for someone without any experience? Um, okay, for a writer without the space degree for content, uh, context affection. <laughs> um, any books on space technology? Goodness. Um, I think this isn't, a lot of my books that I've read are a little bit more, they're not directly on the technology, but I kind of read about astronauts' experiences and things like that, and they include a lot of that information. Um, so one of my favorite books that I've read recently is called Handprints on Hubble. And that's by Kathy Sullivan, who was an astronaut, um, who uh, was one of the one of the first women astronauts. And she talks about how they designed the Hubble Space Telescope to be serviceable from astronauts. So they had to design it such that astronauts could get inside of it and fix it. Um, and she talks all about how when Hubble first launched, it was a giant failure because the pictures came back blurry. And then they had to, you know, launch it launch again and then go in there and then give it a contact lens. And so I learned a lot about the space technology they used that way um, through that. I would say, look also, just like NASA has some really great videos. So if you go to NASA's YouTube page, um, you can find videos about tours of the International Space Station, um, different you know, people about uh, talking about um, different missions and things like that. So just like, that's not a book, but if you go and look through NASA's archives or NASA's webpage or YouTube, they do really good kind of dense information about that. Um, Hopefully that answers your question. I'm going to share my email at the end, and you can also I, I can also just make a list and send that out if you all want to see like science fiction books and education books. <laughs> um, oh, one more direct message. Um, will Mars rovers remain on the planet after it completes its missions? If so, do you see any future problems after more and more projects are launched to the red planet? Um, yeah, so we don't have a way to get them back <laughs> right now. So unfortunately for like spirit and opportunity and Pathfinder, they're just kind of sitting wherever they died. Um, and that's okay because we we make sure that they are as clean as possible before they go. They are built in clean rooms um, and then subject to really high heat to kill any bacteria because we don't want to bring bacteria to Mars and then like discover life and find out that it's just like the common cold because that would be very disappointing. Um, so, you know, Mars is really big and we only have like, 10 things on it right now. So it's not a big problem now. Um, eventually it might be a problem because there's a lot of weird politics and like you can't own the moon, for example. And so you can't like own land on Mars. Um, and it's kind of like the oceans, how they're governed. They're kind of just like the sea. And so um, someone could just like steal a rover at some point, like another country could just go and like take our rover. Um, we just like don't have any laws yet <laughs> about that. So those laws will hopefully get written as we, you know, if we eventually send people, we'll eventually have to cross that bridge and like figure out what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. What does your job look like? Have you worked with rockets? Um, yeah, so right now I'm a, I'm a PhD student. Um, so my job looks kind of like uh, doing a mixture of lots of reading. Um, I work with other astronauts and engineers to talk about what our future habitats are going to look like. So the future space stations that we use. Um, but like my day to day is like kind of boring. It's, it's a lot of just like doing research and reading and coming up with ways to um, basically weigh different technology and which ones we should like really invest in for the future. Um, my internships were a little bit different when I was working with, uh, I worked on Juno, the spacecraft, 
um, which is not a rocket, but it's a spacecraft. And that was a lot of looking at Juno's data that was coming down and saying, is there a way to uh, make sure we catch all the things that might be going wrong with it? Um, and then when I was working at Blue Origin, I was working on rockets um, and that was doing a lot of simulations of landing a rocket on a boat and trying to make sure that um, despite the, the ocean being rocky that we are like very wavy, um, we could still keep the rocket upright and that it wouldn't just fall over once it was on the boat. Um, and so that was my work. My day to day was doing a lot of simulations with that. Um, other, oh man, lots of direct messages here. <laughs> uh, what is the most common form of math that you have had to use and or in, uh, oh, sorry, in engineering. Um, yeah, so don't worry too much about that if you're in high school because you probably won't take it in high school and don't need it yet. Um, but differential equations are is a really, that and linear algebra are two really important maths that you will um, use down the road. Unfortunately, I don't use like, I don't know, like Taylor expansions or like uh, trigonometry that much anymore. Um, but like in college, usually the freshman sophomore first year, second year classes will have linear algebra and diff EQ, and those are really important for engineers. Uh, how will medical technology also play a part in the future space tech projects? Um, yeah, no, that's that's a really important thing um, because when people go to space, uh, it affects their eyesight, it affects their bone density, it affects their muscles. And so medical technology will all be geared towards making sure that people are as healthy as possible. Um, when they come back or when they land somewhere else like Mars, we want them to be able to walk around because right now when astronauts come back, uh, they're pretty shaky and they can't really stand up for very long because they've been floating around for months. Um, and so, yeah, trying to figure out how to, how to mitigate that um, is, is currently a big focus. Um, same with the eyesight thing. So um, for some reason, astronauts lose their eyesight and we actually like, don't really know why. It's not like dramatic, but it's enough that they will need to update their prescription when they come home. Um, and so there's a lot of work into figuring out like ways to simulate gravity in space because that's the biggest issue is really just not having gravity um, because it, it affects your eyes, it affects you know, your muscles and your bones. So. Uh, when is the Artemis mission happening is another question. Yeah, so NASA right now is planning for Artemis 1, which is the demonstration flyby, uh, to be in 2024, I believe. And then between you and me, it will probably not happen until 2025 or 2026 because that's the way delays happen. Um, and with the pandemic also, like everything is just a little bit delayed. Um, so probably the mid 2020s is when I would say Artemis would happen for like the first mission. Okay, awesome. If there are no more questions, because I don't want to hold everyone up too long, that will bring us to the end of our workshop today. Thank you very much, Annika, for joining us again. And if you could drop your email in the chat for anyone who has follow-up questions, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. And like, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I do mean that. Um, cool. And then I know I kind of... Uh, messed up the question about books. And so I actually, if you can send this out to anyone who attended, I can just put together a list of books that people can check out. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, okay. thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I had a great time. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming and we hope to see you in Superposition Toronto's future events and have a great night. <laughs>